And this is Scaling Rails. Real quick, again, though, I wanted to say uh, we're hoping to make this pretty interactive. We're hoping to have a lot of questions from the audience. So if you want to uh, participate, it'd be easier for us if you move down a little bit, because then we can hear you when you're screaming at us. Um, and also, we discovered we have a very large laser pointer. So if we don't like your questions, we'll be burning out your retinas. <laughs> so. Yes. So. Oh, burning. Oh, history lesson. That makes it sound so, like, professorial. Um, all right, so I was with a group on The Point back when it was The Point. Um, so I watched this whole thing explode. I've got like a bajillion stories. I can never remember them like on tap, but whatever, just ask questions. Um, so the project, the, the first Rails stack, you know, project for The Point that we deployed was uh, with Engineered back in July 07. Um, you know, basically, you know, you know their whole stack, right? It's like LAMP sort of, but with Ruby and so it's lame, Lamar or whatever. Um, and it's not Apache either, right? It's Nginx, so whatever. Um, but there's a, there's a few key things they did for us that were awesome that like paid off later. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about it more later, but you know, the whole like memcache system that they have for you, like the split memcaches where you have sessions and fragments separately. Um, that stuff like, it was all in place in the beginning and it paid off like two years later, which is kind of awesome. Um, so anyway, um, <clears throat> it's, worth describing what the point was because it's exactly what turned into Groupon. Um, we had these, this fundamental model of people getting together to solve goals um, subject to some constraint uh, in the middle, like you know, X number of people to accomplish something. Um, and that, that took on several different models right away. We like brainstormed all this stuff over like three or four weeks. Um, and the five that we arrived at were ultimatums where you're trying to like, get together to like topple some huge company like AT&T or whatever for, for screwing over its user base. Um, social actions where, um, I guess it's like a protest, it's protests and with teeth, whatever. Uh, fundraisers, which were huge and still are huge, and it's even part of the Groupon model to this day. Um, and then the two interesting ones, which we brainstormed back then in 07 as well, were the, the market concept, which is Groupon as you know it, um, where a merchant wants to offer something to a, a group of people, but only will only do it for you know, a certain guaranteed amount of of viewership or, or you know purchases or whatever. Um, the one that I really loved though was the inverse market that we had, which was people getting together and demanding something of a merchant. Um, so think Dreamcast. You really love that Sega Dreamcast, and you want it to come back, and Sega won't do it. So you promise them you have you know 100,000 people that'll buy it, and uh, they'll you know they accede to your wishes or whatever. We never pushed with that. I really wish we would have. So if somebody wants to like take that and be like group on number two or group buy or something, go ahead, go right ahead. Um, I'll help. <laughs> These guys are taking notes over here. We're watching you. <laughs> oh man. They have laser pointers too. Oh. <laughs> Is yours this large? <laughs> Damn. Yeah, Andrew, if you're seeing this, don't kill me. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a CEO is just gonna like stab me when I get home. Um, okay, so anyway, um, uh, all these different models, the, the ultimatum stuff, the social stuff, the stuff about you know, like you know philanthropy and and um, you know just alt altruistic things. Like it just didn't work. People don't care. I was we were all really saddened by the fact that people just generally don't care about helping each other. Um, <laughs> but they they do care about money, so it's kind of I don't know. I'm still they care about helping themselves. They do. That's, well, yeah. Anyway. Um, so, anyway, after, after coming up with this, all these different schemes and, like, thinking about the market concept and, and trying it out with a few vendors and a few merchants without the name Groupon at this time, uh, we decided to rewrite the entire app, uh, rework the whole model um, around what we knew was working. So I'll, I'll talk about that later, too, but that was a really interesting point in our, our history. Yeah. Uh, you know, from a, a lesson here, I guess, from an entrepreneurial standpoint is... Um, Rails gives you a lot of flexibility to kind of change direction if you feel like that's something you need to do for your business, which can be harder to do in other stacks where, you know, it's not so easy to just kind of rework the model and, you know, to have a really great test suite infrastructure, all that stuff built in and just say, oh, well, we need to go this direction, go. Um, that, that was really, I mean, I, I wasn't around for the early days of this stuff, but I can still see kind of the repercussions of it in the system and that, um, that would have been really hard to do in other stacks, in a lot of other stacks. Not all of them, I mean, there's a lot of other great dynamic stacks out there you can use, but Rails certainly helped Groupon out a lot in becoming Groupon from something else, right? In, you know, you know, throwing something out there into the ballpark and saying, well, we think this is a good idea, but then being able to 
refine that and change direction and then turn it into what you know became Groupon. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, talking about what really kicked off Groupon then, um, I feel like I sort of touched on it, but um, well, the economy totally tanked, right? Like every startup out there had to like really decide what it was doing and focus on it. Um, and for us, same thing, we had all this investment and we really had to figure out what was working that we were doing um, and only focus on that. So that's when we came up with the, the name for Groupon.com. Um, our editorial chief, uh, Aaron With, um, he came up with it, it was pretty awesome. I've heard so many people claim that they came up with the name like later on, but like whatever. The dude was like high on pad tie at the moment and then he just blurted it out. It's pretty awesome. Um, was the domain really, wasn't it originally um, Get Your Groupon? Something like that? Yeah, because Groupon.com was taken and, you know, had no idea if it was going to work, so we were going to like chase that guy down and try to get it. Um, we ended up settling with him for some crazy amount of money. It was sad. Um, I would have taken the kneecap breaking approach. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, you don't lie very well, Mike. I know. It's terrible. Um, so the, the first example of it, which was... This is actually one of the problems with Rails for us at the time. I mean, it is flexible, it lets you change directions really quick, but this was a total prototype and idea, so we really wanted to do it outside of the Rails stack um, just to try it. So um, what we ended up doing was taking a, and this is our CEO's idea, right? He, like, he loves PHP still to this day too, so he set up WordPress on a media temple box and threw up a blog, and we created this flex widget and a corresponding API on our app that would you know, handle like purchases and showing deals and all this other stuff. Um, so that actually was awesome because we quickly iterated on what Groupon would be, you know, with a few test merchants and a few uh, test customers. Um, so once it was working, you know, like it was, it was this great like loop that we had, like this the site, the flex widget, and the rail stack. Um, but when it started to take off, like the Media Temple servers just like totally went kaput. Um, for every one uh, like web request that Media Temple would be serving, we'd be serving like three API requests, and the rail stack was totally fine. So I remember we ran our first Cubs deal, and we we're everything keeled over, and then Andrew and Ken were just like, all right, we have to get this thing over onto the Rails stack completely, like right now. So we had like a weekend to basically port all this rapidly growing domain logic in the WordPress stack into the Rails stack. And that was, well, it sucked doing it over a weekend, but it was super easy because Rails is just awesome for doing that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, like writing out the active record stuff to pull in WordPress and kind of like a a clean way into the domain, was, it worked out really well. Um, so, so anyway, um, so th that's right at the moment when, when things started really picking up. That's what the traffic looks like. It only goes back to 09, but um, if you zoom in, it still looks like that, even way at the bottom. <laughs> so it's been nuts ever since basically that Cubs deal, it feels like. Um, so another thing too, like a lot of people talk about how you know, we had so many like new features right after we were basically like growing really fast, and it's it's really because we had the impetus and the momentum from you know two years previous or whatever. Um, it didn't just start in late '08, like we were already full steam ahead with Rails. Um, and I don't know what those dips are about. I do know, I, you probably can't see it reflected, but every Christmas, like right around Christmas, everything dips out, down like massively for like a month um, for the last three years running. It's crazy. And I think somewhere in there we offended somebody. That's why it dips down to you. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I think a, a really cool thing to point out if you guys are building Rails applications too is that you can, um, you know, if you make a, a good choice from a hosting provider and you're using pretty much the standard Rails stack, you know, uh, Memcache, Rails, MySQL, or, you know, database of your choice, uh, you can go a really long way. And even today, uh, the meat of Groupon is still running on that stack, right? So, I mean, there's, you know, it, it's impossible to complain that Rails doesn't scale. It's the things that scale are architectures. Um, and when, we, when I was preparing this talk with Mike, um, I was like, cool, scaling Rails. And as I was going through the, the different things that we've had to do, the really places where we've had to get outside of that model, uh, it's, it's, none of it's about scaling Rails. It's just about scaling a web application, right? So if you take Rails out and plug in anything else in that app tier, um, if you were a Groupon clone, it would scale pretty much exactly the same way, right? Um, Rails just makes a lot of things easier and complicates some other things. Um, it's, it really is truly that glue layer where you're just 
you know, shuffling data around between different places. So I think that's, you know, for you guys with startups or with little Rails apps, um, that's a real reassuring thing. Uh, if you have a, a good business model, uh, you can get a really long way on the core stack. So um, the rest of this is going to be about specific stories and scaling uh, our architecture um, that we felt were interesting and like to share with you. So I want to remind you again, if you guys have any questions or something pops in your mind, please feel free to raise your hand up. We'll try to make this a little more interactive. Just out of curiosity, that graph, that's 16 million requests per month approximately? Unique visitors. Unique visitors. Okay, so your requests are significantly higher than that. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, yeah, just the basic shape of the graph, though. Like, if you graph our, you know, database size, like, pretty much every metric you can think of, they all look pretty much similar. So it's kind of, like, tough figure, figuring out which one to show that would be meaningful, but whatever. Number of eyeballs seems to be, like, the thing that matters anyway in the end. And I think with, with like everyone else um, who scales a web application like this, the place where you end up falling over is always the database first, right? So really, um, every strategy we have is about how do we, how do we re reduce load in various ways off of the master database. Um, so a, few, a little bit of our talks about that, some of the things we're doing to do that um, in ways that aren't necessarily intuitive, right? Um, and then we're going to tell some stories about some interesting bits of the application we had to put together. So, so uh, I'm up first. Um, and this first story uh, is an application that, um, a bit of the application that Mike and I both worked on. Uh, and it really stemmed from a business problem. It has, it has to do with scaling the business, not really scaling the app stack, right? So uh, what a lot of people don't realize initially is that Groupon has two very large customer bases. Um, because Groupon is essentially a marketplace. So Groupon is selling products from merchants, right, that's one customer, um, to users, that's another customer. Uh, and the problem, the problem that, they, that they had early on and continue to have isn't servicing the customers, the purchasers, right? Uh, we have that pretty much under control, but it's being able to service all the merchants that want to run on the site, right? Um, and that was a problem with the model they started with initially. Initially, it was a, 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 a deal-a-day site. So they'd have one primary deal that was featured on the page. I'm sure if you've seen Groupon, you know what that looks like. And they would maybe have one other deal they'd call a side deal. So that real estate was really, really expensive. Um, and, and what they wanted to do, what they needed to do, um, is, is be able to run more than two deals in a day, run more merchants so that we could service more merchants and stop them, uh, hopefully, from going to our competition, which we haven't done an exceptionally good job at. But um, uh, the solution, which, which was, you think, wow, so I have to take you know, this huge pool of deals and this huge pool of users and all these different metrics and then calculate who gets the best one. That's like, a, that's like you know, kind of a nerdgasm problem, right? Awesome! I get to use everything, you know. So, so we had the engineering team together, and we're, we're throwing stuff out there, like you know, Hadoop, MapReduce, put this in the cloud, have like a gajillion servers, crunch all this data, and yes, you know, yes. Um, but what what turned what, where we ended up starting was like, wait a minute, let's think about this. Let's think about what we can really do um, out of the gate, because it, it turned out that the hard problem for us wasn't this engineering problem building the engine. It was all the different integration points in the application, right? So we, have, we calculate all this data, right? But we need all the user information. We've got to get all the database. We've got to ship the data over here, crunch it, send it out in millions of emails, right? Have all this data available on the site so that when you come to the site, you can get the stuff that's for you, right? Um, that was really a much harder problem than the engine itself. So we kind of made an executive decision to defer um, the really complex, fun things, unfortunately, and we just wrote it in Ruby. And the incredible thing was uh, our assumptions were totally wrong about what kind of model we need to get away with initially. Um, so we had uh, an engine that supported the entire group on sites oh, six months ago or more that was completely written in Ruby. And we were processing um, you know, selections for 20 million users a day. Um, and it was the first part of the stack where we, we pulled out a whole separate vertical for it, for this engine. Um, we initially started with just the, the core model, using active record, pulling the data, processing through it, um, really quickly got to the point where um, as we were optimizing, we just had to throw active record away because that was too slow. So we were just pulling data right out of the database into hash maps, crunching on that, you know, doing a big transform and spitting out something on the end. And that worked incredibly well. Um, we didn't need to commit to 
Hadoop and all this big infrastructure and learning new languages and learning uh, methods of computation that you know a lot of the team really wasn't familiar with. Uh, it just wasn't necessary. So I think a really important lesson that I took away from that is never be afraid to start small, right? And never be afraid to take that small thing all the way into production if it's working for you. And it did work for us. And the engine has changed quite a bit since then. And we are definitely going to get to the point where um, you know, having a gajillion servers in the cloud and doing big MapReduce operations is going to happen as the engine gets more sophisticated and we start um, contemplating larger and larger data sets. That will happen. But it's definitely not where you need to start. And don't feel compelled to start there, right? Because the, the interesting part of the algorithm has nothing to do with, with your, whether you're constructing it in MapReduce or anything like that, right? Um, that can all be done using you know, bread and butter, object language foo. It's all you really need most of the time. Mm -hmm. One thing to mention, too, is that the algorithm, like some of the first steps that you take towards that stuff, it, it's such a huge lift right away that you, you quickly get into micro-optimization with, with an algorithm like that. I mean, if, you, if you're looking at gender, you're looking at location, that, that's that's a way bigger win right away than like the machine learning stuff. I, I can't even describe the machine learning algorithm, you know? But um, actually, it's not even working, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah. It's awesome stuff. Relevance is, um, it's been the most fun project I think we've, that we've been yeah. a part of. And it's the only thing we've worked on together because we're usually like, you know, we have to parallelize as much as possible on the people side of things. Yeah. Uh, one other story I have to tell here is um, <clears throat> we, we did avoid the giant architecture mistake of jumping right into Hadoop um, and doing something huge in the cloud. Um, but we didn't avoid a smaller architectural mistake where we thought we were going to uh, want to use Redis to store the data at intermediary parts of the transformation. So we'd <coughs> do a bunch of crunching and then push it out to Redis and then pull it down in different processes, do more crunching, push it back out to Redis. Um, and as we were building the, the engine to work in that way, um, we decided instead of using a bunch of mocks to fake out our interactions with Redis, that it was it was interactive enough, and the way we wanted to express our tests, we thought, well, we'll just write a, um, an implementation of the Redis API in Ruby that we can use in our tests, right? So that way, when you're describing tests, we can say, I put some stuff in Redis, you know, I do some, you know, I make some queries, and I get this stuff back, right? And that was all running against our in-memory Redis. Right? We, called pseudo, we called it pseudo Redis. About halfway through uh, building out the first prototype, we realized that the architecture didn't call for this Redis store at all. It was just total Yagni. Um, and, and what really saved us is we, we, had this, um, we had this pseudo Redis that was also tested that acted just like Redis for all the behavior we needed. And we were able to just flip a switch and start using pseudo Redis instead of the real Redis and having it all be in a single process in memory. Um, and that was a instant, you know, huge performance gain for us. Um, and because we, um, you know. <laughs> that was weird, man, because I. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I wrote that first pseudo Redis, and then I saw how you guys were using it. I'm like, no way, this is nuts. This is like evolution. <laughs> it's, it yeah. just happens. It's so cool. I know it's kind of it's kind of a funny story. It, it worked out for us, right? And uh, we we um, we still use pseudo Redis to this day because we've really expanded our use of Redis in other places, and it is still, you know, by far mostly in tests because that's what its initial purpose was. But um, in this case, you know, it, it saved us um, a ton of time early on in, in the engine by just being able to switch this other model and see how it worked, see how it performed. And it worked great. Mm -hmm. Any questions about this? You, sir. Why did we need to use Redis? Um, because when we were engine, we, I think we went too far in engineering the prototype before we actually started to work on something. So we had this model in our head where we were like, okay, we'll crunch some stuff, we'll put it in Redis, and then somebody else will pull it down and crunch it. And I think, um, we made a mistake in thinking that that would save us memory, that'd save us heap space, so we could, you know, stream all this stuff, you know, off of disk, straight through us into Redis, and then stream it back through into Redis again. Um, and that was just, it didn't really work out that way, right? The cost of shipping all that stuff across the wire, even to something crazy fast like Redis, for, you know, millions and millions of records, um, it's just way faster to keep it all in the same process. So when we made that realization, we're like, oh, crap. Do I have to re-architect the whole thing? No, I can just, well, you pseudo Redis, hey. And it worked. Yeah, the, the other issue, too, is with, with Redis, it's, it's still not truly distributed. So you're kind of limited to the memory on that one box that's running it. So if our needs, you know, after a few months had grown to be on, like, the size of what engineer was willing to give us on one slice, we'd, we'd have to, like, shard somehow or, like, partition ourselves, like, with Redis. And, like, the, 
Redis 2.0, like distributed stuff's like on the way, I guess. I'm, I'm not sure where it's at. Um, I heard it's very close. I'm excited about that, the Redis clustering. I am too, because we, we use Redis a lot, so it would really help us. So take one more question on this one, if anyone has one, and then we'll move on. Nothing, okay. DevOps. Were we really gonna talk about DevOps? Oh yeah, yeah. You um, were gonna talk about DevOps. <laughs> Um, it's funny because my, my take on it's not the normal one, I think. Anyway, so uh, our take on it initially was like developers not thinking about systems at all, right? Totally focused on the point and the concept and the model and the domain model. Um, so having Engine Yard initially was totally awesome because they took care of all that stuff. Like I was mentioning, they set up all of our systems. Um, we got to be as ideological as we wanted for a year, um, which is, it was good. Normally that, that kind of thing spirals out of control, but it was definitely good. Um, so you know we didn't we didn't have to think about MySQL configs or or any of that um, deployment strategies. The, the fact that they got us hooked up with like that one click deployment early on was it's probably the best thing they've done for us. And that really hasn't fallen apart. I mean you hear about Facebook how they have to do like distributed deployments because they have so many servers and they can have like one master server deploying out to all these other all these others. And Twitter with their murder setup that's kind of it's cool, but we've avoided having to do anything like that. Um, actually, the one pileup that you do find it, it might. Might not just be engine yard stack specific, but like you know, you're trying to do a deployment with like 50 servers or something like that kind of thing. Usually, like can cripple that initial server. And for us, it did a few times. Like the the file system serving our one you know uh, <clears throat> our one checkout to all these boxes. It would just I/O would shoot up on it. It would kill everything during deployments. Like the whole site would go down. Um, it took a while to get out of there. Like it ended up being like we just have to give every bit of I/O resource we can to that one master server. Um, but when you do that and you spend the money on it, it gives you more headroom than anything. So it's, it's one of the good things about having a lot of funding is that like you can avoid some of the interesting fun projects like distributed deployments for a super long time, given that you have the cash. Um, that sucks for de developers when to do really fun stuff, but it's kind of awesome for <laughs> for feature development. You know, you don't have to think about anything else. Um, so uh, even you know we've hit a lot of their limits, a lot of their scaling limits. Um, but engineer is still helping us. We're building on an operations team now, and they're, it's, that's still effectively keeping developers out of like the system administration's soup. So just generally about DevOps, I don't think, I'm not really big on that concept. Um, and you know, we aren't as an organization, so it might work for others. But, but that's, I think that's gonna <clears throat> be changing, um, because as the, we're getting to a point where um, the sophistication of the deployment and the scale that the company's operating at, we just we have to have our own operations staff. So that's that's started now, and we're starting to hire DevOps people, and that's going to start to change. Um, one of the things I want to say about this is when I was when I was thinking about what to talk about in this talk, and I'm like, rail scale is just fine, you know. I mean, so then I got thinking about well, what, you know, if something went away in the rail space, what would be the thing that would just kill scalability for rails? Um, and, and I thought of a couple. Things. One, um, it would be virtualized systems, right? Being able to just spin up a bunch of slices whenever you want to someplace and have them start serving traffic, right? Um, Rails suffers, or Ruby suffers from being pretty computationally intense. So, you know, bottom line is uh, if you want a big Rails app, you're probably going to have a lot more hardware in the app tier than someone running uh, in a language that's a lot more computationally performant. So, all of a sudden, that means all this tooling infrastructure we have. Um, that just is conveniently there, right? Um, you know, Capstrano or um, whatever deployment strategy you're using, um, being able to spin up a bunch of boxes in the cloud whenever you want and have them start serving traffic. If that didn't exist, if we were still in the world of, you know, if you need a new server, you gotta call up somebody and they gotta pull something out of the rack and walk over and plug it in, I mean, that rails wouldn't scale, right? I mean, that's, that's what makes the magic happen, uh, is, is being able, to, having this tool, this tool chain there where you can just, you know, Pretty, pretty quickly, pretty easily have a one-click deploy to a thousand servers, right? And eventually, you start to run into interesting issues like the I.O. problem. But those are all surmountable. Uh, the point is you can get really far scaling that way before you start having that trouble. And if that tool chain wasn't there, Rails wouldn't scale, I don't think. Questions? Okay. <laughs> so, SOA or SOL. Um, well, as you can imagine, um, uh, Groupon has uh, two big problems. Uh, one is that they have tons of money, right? Well, that's, that's kind of... <laughs> 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 
that, that's a double-edged sword, right? They've got just tons of money to spend on whatever they want to spend it on. Um, and one of those things they like to spend it on is building the, the best engineering team in the world. Um, now, if you're a developer working on their applications, that's kind of terrifying, right? You think, oh my god, they're going to hire a gajillion, gajillion people. They might all be awesome people, but, you know, developers like herding cats, you get, you know, you get 15 guys together, and that seems like a, it's a gigantic team, and there's all kinds of problems. So, like how, do you, how do you solve that? One, right? Two, um, you've got this at web application that's just, you know, going crazy. Um, how, how do you get load off the master database? I mean, that's, that's bottom line. How do you get load off the master database, right? Um, so, first thought is, you spin up a bunch of replicas, right? You defer as much read traffic as you can to the replicas and you have master handle right. Well, now we're at the point where um, we can't have a single master database because the write load's too high, right? So we run a big deal. Uh, we can't have all those transactions coming in, right? Um, how do you solve that problem? Well, one of the ways you can solve it is by re-architecting the system so that you pull load out of the master, right? So one of the big initiatives is going to be moving towards a service-oriented architecture um, for a couple of big reasons. One is it lets us organize small groups of really efficient teams around one part of the vertical stack, like purchasing, right? So now we can have an editorial stack where people are putting content up this, on the site and running deals, and we can have a separate purchasing stack that handles taking people's orders, you know, charging their credit cards, and all that kind of stuff. And they can be on se totally separate verticals, right? So now we have another master database we can scale write load on instead of just the one, right? And we can do that in a bunch of different places. And like I said, that's, that's really, really nice in a couple different ways. It lets us scale the organization in a way that makes sense, so we can have these small focused teams, and it double, doubly lets us you know, rem uh, remove load on master. Um, that does introduce other scaling issues now because we have, we have to have SLAs between these different APIs. You know, how do we, you know, if you've got, you know, a purchase coming in from master has to call an API to send that over there, has to go someplace else. Um, how do we make sure that whole chain is going to be performant enough? And those are still things we're figuring out, but that's uh, definitely where we're going. Let me check my notes here. Uh, another thing that's really cool about this is it lets, it lets us choose the right tools for the job, right? Just like a lot of other big organizations that have scaled out. Um, I mean, we're not going to make the rallying cry, that, oh crap, Rails doesn't scale, I have to rewrite this in, in Scala or whatever. Um, uh, because that's just not true. It's the architecture that doesn't scale. The architecture breaks down at some level. And at some level, you're, you're going to want to choose more appropriate tools. Like, I'm pretty sure for the, you know, the end game for the relevant system, a lot of that's going to be written in Java, in Hadoop, because that's the native language for it. We could choose something else, um, but uh, having, having small teams that are working fairly independently lets them, freeze them to make the right technical decisions um, from an infrastructure standpoint, so that we don't have to always be a rail shop, you know, because there are definitely other languages that are more appropriate for uh, different problem spaces. So it prepares us for that. <coughs> And right now, I think we have a few verticals. Um, we have the order processing system I mentioned. We have the main kind of editorial app stack that serves the public site. And we also have the, the relevance engine. And we're looking for more verticals that we can pull out. Mm -hmm. There's different criteria that we use there, too. Oh, go ahead. Um, quick question, you, uh, the teams that work in the vertical, how big do they tend to be? <clears throat> I would prefer them never to be larger than seven. That's not true right now, but um, I, I definitely would. I feel very strongly that team lar teams larger than seven for me, I feel, I feel like I start to get diminishing returns. The communication overhead between syncing all those people starts to become a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh. we had more questions. Um, how, easy to find, how easy do you find it to extract the verticals while you're dealing with the living application? It's really freaking hard. Um, on the upside, uh, that's one place where Ruby really shines, right? Because it's really easy to introduce a new abstraction and hide some service, but there's still, there's still so much going on that it's, it's tricky, but I can imagine it'd be a lot harder in other places than it is, than it is for us in Ruby. Yeah, de depending on where you do with those, some, sometimes it's easier than others. I mean, ideally there's like a sort of difficulty, like priority for how to pull these things out. I mean, for me, like the, the best way that things carve up is based on the domain. If there's like a clear perforation in the domain model and it just naturally like segments that way, it's just naturally easier to split it out as well. Yeah. Um, sometimes there's like performance reasons or like the consumer is different, like the editorial people versus like customers and uh, that gets a lot harder. Um, and also any, anytime there's like a severely different like data profile, like the relevance engine, like relevance engine could have totally been all up in our domains business, but um, it needed a massively different like data 
stack. So that was a perfect reason to separate it out that way. And that one, separating it out or cutting that stuff out wasn't really hard per se, right? Just the relevant decision was easy because we didn't have one, right? So we didn't have one already that we had to re-architect. So we got to choose and we just, I mean, it, it was obviously so different from the, the normal processing change chain that the web app goes through that it was obvious, oh, we need to spin up a vertical for this. Mm -hmm. The other, pro the other thing too, though, is um, if you, it, well, there, there's still all these different services, and some teams have to like build features that cut across, you know, all of these different services as well. There's probably no way to really design your services so that you can avoid that problem. I think, unless you're, well, who knows? Maybe it is possible. But we haven't. Um, We're still writing to the main master right now. Like that's the last step in our re-architecture plan. Well, when we, um, it's not, we're not distributing a single database. So we, we can still handle consistency at the app layer. So we're gonna have a whole, so um, we're gonna have, the two masters we're, we're planning to have is one for order processing, right? And basically you'll have a, you'll have a successful persist, you know, act that comes back from that that you get in the app side. So we can handle, right now we're planning to handle all that consistency stuff in the app layer, right? Um, on the other side of it, like for reporting and stuff, there's a, a kind of another separate vertical where we have um, a big distributed database that we just load all our stuff into that they, that they can use for BI and metrics and things. Um, there's no right concerns there, though. Are you using synchronous, asynchronous, or both in the communication between these service layers? Uh, both, whatever is most appropriate. Um, Whatever we can defer, it's preferable, obviously, because that gives us, you know, um, it doesn't lock us into having, you know, big stuff in the request chain, which is a huge problem. Do you problem. Have a hint as to what you're using underneath the, both of those layers, so asynchronous and asynchronous? I mean, synchronous is HTTP, asynchronous are using some sort of message layer or message queue or what? Uh, yeah, we are. Our, our go-to right now has been rescue so far. Okay. So we have... Um, and Typhus for consuming our own services, too. Yeah, for HTTP services. Warner Bogle's talks um, on Amazon and the way their SOA stuff works inside Amazon is really good. If you can look at, look them up, because for the home page of Amazon, when you hit that page, it gets hundreds of requests to composite that page in under a second. So, I mean, looking at the way they actually <coughs> Yeah, that's, you know, hopefully we'll get there someday. I'll definitely check that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not anywhere in Amazon yet, I don't think. But. Yeah, that's the pretty awesome part is like the, you know, revenue, like how big we seem to like how intense the application, the data requirements are, like the ratio is kind of not your normal ratio. We, we have a lot of headroom to grow. It's pretty awesome. Is it? Moving, oh wait, thank you. Uh, well, it depends on how they're architected, right? So the relevance engine, since it doesn't really depend anything on the, the rail stack, it's pretty different. Um, now, do you mean like common dependencies from an app, app standpoint? Like, oh, hey, I've got this shared module that I include in a bunch of different places. Yeah, I, I was on a project once where they did that, where um, they had this crazy architecture where they basically put the model in a library and then included the library in a bunch of different pieces that all shared the same model. Um, and that made me want to kill myself. Uh, so we, um, we definitely, uh, I'm, I'm super against sharing model between stacks. I believe each stack should have its own model, and if that means having um, a, a same but slightly different representation of an entity, you know, so be it. That's, that's way preferable to me than trying to, you know, put all the logic. Oh, I have one user. I want one user model, right? Dry. Uh, yeah, um, it, it, at some level, of when you're building different app, when you're really building different applications, right? I'm going to have an application that does this one thing, an application that does this one thing. You might have um, representations of an entity that are they're the same entity, but they mean different things in different applications, and so that logic should not be shared. I mean, you're not drying things up that way; you're just making things worse. Um, I think for everything else that does make sense, like totally, you know, horizontal library stuff, like logging. Yeah, we have tons of shared libraries, and that's all totally natural. You know, you plug them in with gems or what have you.
things have different roles in different uh, places, so it makes sense to represent them differently because you've been bitten by actually you missed something that should have been shared. Not yet, and it's totally possible. But um, we just we don't do it yeah. that often. I mean, we, we are pretty dry. We just don't go like overboard with it. Uh, I mean, there is an interesting story there. Not really with sharing, but um, uh, you know, as Mike mentioned early on, this this started out as a completely kind of different application. So it was the point, right? And then a lot of a lot of what Groupon became to be was engineered back into the original point code. So we definitely have and had and still had a problem with legacy, where you had these this. Um, legacy really domain terminology that hung around in the application. Um, that's been a long road to clean that stuff up because it, it's, it's hard, you know, you have a class that's referenced in a thousand places, you want to change the name of it, that doesn't seem that hard, but it's, you know, it's uh, um, vexing sometimes, right? Um, and, you know, then you want to change the table name, that can be kind of hard. It's, um, so that stuff does come up and it's, um, it's a hard thing to do in, in any language. I feel though, like for Ruby specifically, um, I feel like that's one of the places where I miss my Java tool chain, right? And the static analysis stuff that, that you can do in Java. Sorry, I was a Java guy. But, um, you know, I'm like, oh, change the name of class, da da da, you know? Um, you can do that stuff in Ruby, but it's, it's a, still uh, a little more manual than, than you can get away with in other stacks. So, yeah. I, I cry a little bit about that, but I think it's, I think um, all the other benefits of the language make it worth it. I wouldn't go back. That's kind of a that's kind of a business problem too. Like one thing I'll find is like somebody will introduce a new concept and a few months will go by and then with all these different departments and like hundreds of people slightly, you know, referring to things slightly differently, like it's um it's kind of almost outside of like a developer's job, but we you end up having to like chase everyone down, get everyone on the same page about certain concepts, you know, form some sort of dictionary for them and then like propagate that naming or those you know, those concepts all the way through the system whether it be wikis, their systems, Salesforce, our application, our database. Um, so really being hardcore about domain-driven design is like, you know, it goes beyond the rail stack. So the rail stack's like the easy part, changing names, as far as I'm concerned. So we have eight minutes left, so I'm gonna vote for skipping this one, because we have more cooler stuff to talk about. That's the awesomest one, though. Is it? No, it's not. Is it really? People? <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm a programmer. I don't want to talk about people. All right, it's cool. We'll, we'll, come, we'll, we'll come back to it. <laughs> yes. We will come back to it. <clears throat> okay, uh, the big little rewrite. So <clears throat> we've got this uh, developer from Motiva, Chris Chandler. I love talking to the guy. He's so like animated. And um, one thing that he loves talking about, and he, he does this at his talks too, is um, about this event horizon for startups where you know, you're, everything's all malleable, you get to like decide what you're doing, you get to change direction a few times, and then at some point, success hits, things accelerate really fast, and then everything you're doing just congeals, and you really lose all that flexibility, flexibility that you had. So all the decisions that you've made up to that point, you're kind of stuck with them for the most part. Um, and changing something that seems trivial like before that point becomes like, you know, a re-architecture of sorts. Um, so uh, for Groupon, I mean, for Groupon specifically, I, I feel like we knew exactly what we were doing, um, and it's still pretty applicable, like the, the model that we had in our minds to like what we're doing now. Um, from the point. Yeah, from the point. Um, we just didn't have a name for it. But you know, we, we got to do, we decided to do a huge rewrite at that time, and it worked. Like you, you normally hear that like the big rewrite is like the, the wrong thing to do. I heard Ken Beck talking about it, and everything he said was totally like true. It felt like good advice, except we didn't follow that because you know we had, we had our own needs. Like, Every, every company's differently, and we knew we had to do something like that. Um, so we did this rewrite, and Rails definitely made it super easy. I think the most important part for us was we, ha you know, we had some heavy integration tests. We had a, a good Selenium suite. We had um, like the RSpec integration tests were also like pretty fleshed out for for just about everything high level. Um, so that made a perfect pivot point to like rewrite. You know, <clears throat> we got to blow away most of our implementation, keep all the high level stuff, and surprisingly, we missed barely anything. Um, and we also did a active record style, you know, an entirely new migration, uh, entirely new database supported by like active record migrations that we patched up to to port all that stuff. Um, so anyway, it, it was easy to do a full rewrite. It, it really it, within three weeks, two people we just hammered away at it. It was not that bad. Um, I can't say if it would be easy for every project, but whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, that's it. So it, it's doable. I wouldn't suggest doing it for like everything, but you know. Do you think you could have got away with it without the test suite? Absolutely not. 
it was totally crucial. I mean, you're flying blind without a test suite. You, you know, it, yeah, that, that's what your system is, right? What your tests tell you it's doing. Um, without that, it would have been impossible. Yeah, me again, bending rails. Um, okay, so the focus of this talk was supposed to be like how Rails is awesome, how it scales, how you barely have to do anything and it just works. And you find out the beauty of like the Rails stack as you get to these like upper echelons of performance and, and stuff. Um, <clears throat> My take on it is not the same, though, because I like fixing the problems with Rails, uh, the stuff that becomes an issue for us, and you know, I'm pretty pessimistic about it for whatever reason. Um, so anyway, like more on the DDD stuff, like the, the expressiveness of Active Record. DDD is domain-driven design stuff? Dunkin' Donuts. Oh. Dongle. <laughs> Had nothing for the third D. Fail. Uh, yep. Um, I do want a donut, though. Um, <laughs> So uh, anyway, uh, in support of like really going hardcore with like your domain driven design, it doesn't quite give you every tool that you need. So we patched up Active Record to allow you to do stuff like take scopes and compose them so you can refer to them in, in uh, condition hashes and at any level of nesting, you can recurse through associations. You can do all this amazing stuff that like, even just like if I brought up the console, it'd be like kind of nuts to see. But um, Basically, we've made Active Record like super powered, put rockets on it. The thing's just amazing. Um, and the other cool thing is, you know, you can have this huge nested description of your model, like at all, at all these levels of nesting. And you can apply it to the database if you want, which is like the customary Active Record thing, or to an object graph in memory, which is super powerful. Um, we're still making use of that to make the site more awesome. But um, I'll be doing a, a talk at RailsConf about that, so you can wait till then. Um, so anyway, um, we, we also patched up Action Controller because the REST support in Rails wasn't quite what we wanted it to be. Um, there's a lot of actions that it didn't support, you know, stuff with collections and um, figuring out how to like interleave security and uh, you know authorization, different con concepts in there. It's not really Rails doesn't do anything for you. Period. You know, not that it does it bad or anything. Um, so we had to we had to add extensions to Action Controller to support all that. And we did them in, you know, not the Java verbose way where everything's like right there, you know, like declarative. It's, it's all just kind of like magic. It just happens for you, like following certain conventions. Um, you know, I, I think people argue a lot about declarative versus imperative programming, and I definitely prefer declarative over imperative, but I prefer nothing at all over declarative, um, which is kind of the Rails way, so that's sort of what our extensions look like. Um, Uh, and yeah, that's all I had really. Um, there's lots of really fun examples. Which, wish we had time to go through them. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll be here for the rest of the conference, obviously. So if you want to talk about any of this stuff in, in excruciating detail, feel free to track us down. It's excruciating too. Yeah, <laughs> it will be excruciating. So you've been warned. Um, we have a minute and three le left, and I really want to talk about this because this is one of my babies. But um, uh, one of the problems we had with write load is people like 20,000 people want to buy the same thing at the same exact time, right? Um, and at first, you know, we had no, no locks in the database. So you'd have this table of, of codes we're giving away, right, for a customer. And, you know, you have a few hundred people buying things, not a big deal. You have a few thousand people buying things, ah, that's such a big deal. You have 20,000 people trying to buy the thing all at once. Then all of a sudden, two people are getting pointed at the same record just out of a, a pure um, race condition, right? So the knee jerk reaction was throw a lock in. You know, so we threw a, a table lock in uh, for for this set of rows that we're selecting from, and that solved the problem from the user's perspective, where whilst we gave the same code to two people, uh, but that introduced another huge scaling problem for us, where now we had this um, row lock contention going on in the busiest table in the in the database. Um, so our our solution to that, which has been fantastic, is to use Redis in a few different forms. Um, we use Redis for atomic counters, so we can keep track of exactly how many we sold and then shut it down immediately. Um, and that, that atomic counter lets us, uh, you know, spread that count across a thousand different app servers. And they can all just ping away atomically saying, I sold one, I sold one, I sold one, and then we shut it down immediately. Um, it, all lets, it also lets us do cool things like load a whole bunch of promotion codes up into Redis and, you know, just atomically distribute them, boom, 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 you know. And then we run out, we go, we go back to the database and pull that stuff back into Redis, load it up again, run through 10,000. Um, and that's been great for us. I mean, um, Rescue is really the gateway drug, um, but now we're using Redis for all kinds of stuff. And it's, it's been really fantastic and really fast, um, and it's been uh, a, great, a great tool for us to fall back on. 
Um, I think we're out of time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a few questions until they kick us out. So, or they can just, or, you, or we can just leave. <laughs> Uh, I would, if I could, I would, I would burn XML off of the face of the planet. Um, uh, I, I, I would prefer to, put, to use JSON services for anything. I know for our public APIs, we still support XML just because, you know, yeah, that's no, how it, it is. It's, it's real, it's real REST though. I, it, we don't like adhere to like the, the document like, you know, perfect, but it's definitely not XML over, over the wire. Um, we, we do have some external services that we integrate with that use just raw XML. It's just ridiculous that they even call that REST. Um, but now we, we have a REST service, REST API. Um, our, you know, there's lots of external affiliate consumers. There's our own iPhone consuming it. It's, um, it's pretty rich and robust, and it's getting more robust every day. Any more questions? All right, yeah, we'll hang out up here at the front for a while if you want to come talk to us. But uh, thank you a lot, everybody.